First of all, thank you very much. אני לא מדבר עברית, I'm very sorry. בערבית כן ממכן אם אתם רוצים, אבל אני לא יודע אם אתם תפעמו כל שיעני. אז אני אולי אולי יותר להשתמש באנגלית. My name is Clemens Messerschmidt. I'm German, as you already mentioned, and uh, I'm a hydrogeologist by profession, meaning groundwater, the water that is in the rocks, Maim Tahom, is my uh, specialization. And I came here uh, with the German water project in 1997. This is 20 years ago. This was a project with GTZ, German Technical Corporation, one of the big, big uh, super tankers of German Development Corporation, with the cities or municipalities of Nablus and Ramallah, uh, the waterworks, Maf'al Hamaim, there. And we were making a project for water or groundwater resource development. Or easily saying, we were drilling wells or trying to drill wells. Um, that, that's was, that was why I was uh, employed. I worked there for four years, and um, then I worked in a British-Palestinian project with the University of Newcastle and British Geological Survey and so on as a counterpart Palestinian Water Authority in Ramallah. Um, was a groundwater resource um, exploration or research project. So we were making research mainly on the Agan Yarkontaninim, the Western Aquifer, um, which was not really on the map of the Palestinian then, and maybe I will tell you later why. Uh, not practically developing it, but trying to lay a groundwork for developing it. Since then, since 2005, I'm a freelance hydrogeologist, freelancer. I make uh, projects here or there or there, short-term uh, involvements. And I also move more and more into a second leg. Not only technical work, but also hydro-political work. Um, because, of course, this bloody water story, you run your nose against the wall again and again and again. Why? Because there's a political wall put up for progress in these water projects. You can't avoid of, of actually dealing with it. And I'm working already far too long on a PhD and try to finish it on also groundwater resource. Um, and that is really a technical scientific work only. It's uh, deep hydrogeology, it's groundwater recharge in the Yalkontaninim Basin, in Nahal Natuf, in the Wadi Natuf, west of Ramallah, and so on. And um, tomorrow I fly to Germany to see my to see my professor. So I'm much more nervous about that than about being here. I'm starting now. I will talk about uh, water myths, first of all, mythology of uh, water, ardent, hard myths that exist since ages and are in the mind of everybody, including me in the past. I'm working a lot on that. Then I will, of course, explain the resources how much water is there, and so on. And of course, move to the main thing, the O word, the occupation. Um, then show shortly the questions of distribution and how this crisis materializes, although you can really see it every day and uh, it's not far for you to see on the surface. And then I will talk about the donors, the projects, the stuff we are doing what we are helping or actually what we are not helping and why we are not making project, uh, progress. And maybe in the end, if there's time, I could talk a little bit about negotiations if that is still an issue at all. I don't know. Let's start. There are many water myths I, uh, I am collecting. I will only present a few here. First of all, uh, Israel is a dry country or Palestine is a dry country. It's all uh, desert, it's all dry, and that's th why there is not enough water. That's why there is a conflict. That's why you and the Palestinians struggle over water. That's the most uh, basic thing that everybody has in mind. Second, Israel's water sector suffers from constant scarcity and drought. If you look to the website 
of the water authority in Israel, you will always see the scarcity issue, the drought issue, and so on. Israel is trying to manage in this drought climate. Israel made the desert bloom, of course. You all uh, have heard about it. And Palestinians don't exist, which probably sounds strange to you, especially why is this a water myth? I will explain. To begin with, so is it a dry country or not? Well, really, it depends on your point of view, literally. This is the familiar picture from the south. You have the Sinai in the foreground, Aqaba, Elat, and here would be the border between Egypt and Israel, or Eretz Israel, or historical Palestine. Gaza would be here, you see, and the Dead Sea and so on. So, it's all rocks, it's all desert, it's all dry, exactly what we think, no? Yeah, no wonder. Well, exactly the same area, just seen from the north, is that one. And then you see immediately a dichotomy, a split in two. You see a wet, green northern half and a dry south. The line is, yeah, that's much better, thank you. The line is here would be Gaza, you see. And we are here, Tel Aviv, no? Haifa, Dead Sea, yeah, Yamamelach, uh, Jerusalem, Ramallah, Nablus, Lake Tiberias, or Kineret, and so on. Beersheba, just here. So you have a split. You have, as you can see, and it's familiar on all the maps, a wet north and a dry south. This is from the Ministry of Agriculture, just came out. And you see especially a, a top of rain in the Galil, and then Mount Carmel, West Bank. This backbone gets all the rain from the Mediterranean. You probably have learned all this in school, no? Um, probably what you have not learned is that, for example, Jerusalem has more rain than Berlin. Well, that is probably unfamiliar to you. And um, Ramallah is a little bit more north of, uh, of Jerusalem, has a bit more rain, because also it's not a city climate. Cities, the climate is always desert climate, and um, is more exposed. So Ramallah actually has more rain than London, London Heathrow. Admittedly, London Heathrow is one of the driest stations in England, but still, it's not really desert. You don't have too much camels running around, at least not on four legs. And Nablus, for example, has even more, has about the amount of Paris, Paris, okay? Second, Israel's water sector suffers from constant drought and scarcity. Well, we should approach this topic in two ways. One is domestic water, drinking water that you have for the house, or municipal water, which also includes schools and hospitals and that stuff. Do you know the three sectors of the water, of the water economy? No? Hahaklaot, yani agriculture, industry, and domestic or municipal water. Okay, that's the three sectors, like the three sectors of economy. <coughs> so, we have around 60% of all water that Israel uses. Israel uses around about 2,000 million cubic meters a year. You know what million cubic meters is? Do you know what a cubic meter is? Kam liters, eh? Elef, exactly. It's one meter by one meter by one meter. So that's one cubic meter. Million is the unit I will always talk in, okay? 2,000, around 1,200 million cubic meters are for agriculture. So the bulk of water goes to agriculture. What is coming now? Let's start with domestic, sorry. First of all, the domestic. Domestic use in Israel has reduced a little bit in the last years, but you will just see in a second how much, is much higher than, for example, domestic use in Germany. Uh, the municipal or domestic use uh, here is around 250. It's actually each year changing. So 247, 264, and so on. German use has now come down to 122 liters. So that's all, that's all. When I studied it was 145 liters, now it's 122, that's the average again. Um, the explanation is green conscience. It's not a state campaign, it's mostly 
people and the green movement saying we should use water wisely. The term in Germany is to use it wisely. Okay? It's not about being scarce or being afraid or something, but to be wise. Okay? Yes. Not to lead. Yes, each of you, each day, 250 liters, okay? That is very, very high. And why does Israel need more than two times the amount of Germany? I don't understand. Uh, maybe Germans don't wash. Okay, true. But still, you know, there is room really to save. Let's have a look at the numbers. This is from the... This is from the um, uh, Water Authority of Israel, and you see in cubic meters, leshana uh, per person per year, okay, which you have to translate then into liters accordingly. I put some numbers in blue, okay. That's just the translation: liters per capita per day. So you see in the 60s, 204 liters, moving up to a record 318 in the late 80s when you had your first water crisis. Remember, some of you. Huh? self-made water crisis, and then a drop, and then this phenomenal winter again rising, and you get this erratic pattern since the 90s, which means that the sector is on the limit. This is a, a typical sign for, uh, for such an erratic pattern. And then you had the uh, big water saving campaigns after 2005-06, maybe you remember, Tsipi Livni, Netanyahu, and so on, and <laughs> went all through Haaretz, but yeah, you call it high. Yes, she calls it high payments. And, um, and, uh, but still, where we are is about this, okay? That's why I say it, about 250. Oscillations, but on a very high level. Ah, do you know how much water a person should have? 100? Exactly. For domestic all, drinking, washing, cleaning, and so on. At home, yes, 100 liters. There is no clear law, there is no cut decision by international law, United Nations or something, but there is this recommendation that is really archetypical by the World Health Organization, WHO, saying each human being on planet Earth should have for a dignified life, not for survival, you can survive in a, in a prison with a bit of bread and two liters, no problem. But for a dignified life, 100 liters of water per day. And uh, there are fear, four factors that are important. Um, no, that's the way it starts. If you say minimum, that's the way it starts. Um, four factors, it should be the amount, okay? <coughs> then it should be the reliability that you can really have it every day, that you are, can be sure it comes which is one of the big problems, Bestachim, okay? Uh, then you should have, have, have it in uh, uh, um, sufficient quality, which is the huge problem in Gaza. And you should have it as an affordable price, which is also a huge range within the West Bank according to whether you are lucky or not. Now, inside Israel, this is again Israeli official documentation, except this. I added this. I put this. You have a huge difference, and it's much too small for you to see, but these are the cubic meters per person per year. And you see, if you count only the Jews in Israel, you have this one. Okay? If you count all municipal use nationwide, local authorities, kibbutzim, moshavim, and so on, then you have this, around 100 cubic meter per year. If you count, and this is over the years, 96 till 2005, okay? Uh, if you count municipal use in local authorities, okay, and local councils, you have this amount. If you count residential use and private gardens in local authorities, you have this amount. If you look at only the minorities, how they call them, I guess the Arabim, okay? The 48 Palestinians inside Israel, you have this amount. So you have a huge gap. And then, you come to the West Bank supply, around here, 31 cubic meter per person per year. To condense it and just compare Israeli average, Palestinian average, you have this amount. So if you get 100 liters per day, per year that would be 36, 36 cubic meters, okay, 36.5. Now this number 
is around this range. But you have to see that in the West Bank this includes industrial consumption. Because we don't have disaggregate figures in the Palestinian water sector that says how, how much domestic and industrial separate. It's always municipal together. Probably also because there is no large industry. You only have small industry. And it's all by source. It's sourced always through the municipalities. No independent access. So we call it municipal water, not domestic. Does it mean sanitation as well? Municipal sanitation? What is sanitation? Yes, yes. This municipal supply includes universities, includes schools, includes if in Tel Aviv you need to have a green lawn beside the highway, okay, because you think that you must be like Scotland, then this includes is included. And Urishani was once asked, why do you need this lawn? Why does the, the uh, highway at the Arcon have to look like Scotland? He said, but that's marvelous. Isn't it great? So he's proud of it. Okay, he's proud of it. And you see that, of course, because the population is increasing, the absolute figures here, the bars, are rising strongly, while, as I already showed, the per capita here, these dotted lines, are actually more or less uh, oscillating. This is a very recent figure from um, the Israeli website of the Water Authority showing the sectors in colors. The two colors green is agricultural water. So as I said, around 1,200 million cubic meters for agriculture. Huh? Then you have a very small one, the purple here. This is industrial water. Israel uses very little water for industry. And then you have the other big chunk, domestic water. And then you have these curious little things on top, the icing here on the cake, orange and red. The orange is the water that Jordan, the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, gets from Israel as kind of compensation for what Israel takes from the Jordan River, which of course is a joke. And the red is the amount that is given to the Palestinians According to Oslo, it, before Oslo there was already buying water, especially since Sharon 1980-81, when he was minister, uh, buying water, but in smaller quantities. The only source that has increased uh, over the period of Oslo is the purchase of water of Palestinians from Mekorot. We are now even above the 50, we are not in 2011, we have reached almost 60 million cubic meters. So. When the Israeli Hasbara always says, well, look, our, the water we give to Palestinians has, in, has doubled, okay? has even gone beyond Oslo, then you have to say, yes, this is true. This is correct. The number is correct. <coughs> but, <laughs> but Oslo was supposed to stop here, no? The latest to finish the final negotiation status agreement was 1999, July 99, and since then it drags on. You will excuse me, I call Osmo, uh, Oslo a zombie, okay? It's something that is dead and still walking, okay? And nobody is willing to bury it. And the more important thing is, of course, look how ridiculous, miserable this amount is compared to the rest. So is this a source of pride? Yeah, look, it has doubled 30, 50, look here. Well, this is 2,000, okay? This is a shame, actually. When you know the numbers, it's a shame, this argument. At least I think so. Now, agriculture is even a bigger story, and nobody talks about it. I will come back to agriculture several times today, because the big amounts go to agriculture, as you have already seen, 60%. Now, Israel, as you all know, has long stopped being an agricultural economy. It's not in the 1950s anymore. Israel is a modern uh, economy with industry, high-tech industry, <coughs> computer, software, hardware, and of course arms, weapons, seventh biggest uh, weapon exporter in the world, and so on. You know all that. Agriculture, according to the Central Bureau of Statistics, every year you can look it, uh, look it up in the um, statistical abstract. Agriculture contributes to the gross domestic product of Israel's economy 
It's nothing. 2.95%. Some years it's 2.2, some years 2.6, okay? It's nothing. It's like two days of strike or three holidays, okay? If you take all agriculture, irrigated, non-irrigated, all of it, and scrap it. It's less than the oscillation from year to year of total economy. But it takes all the water, 60% of the water. A complete disconnect. So here, since you already mentioned it, yes, this graph shows exactly fresh agricultural marginal. There is a shift in the relation, still it's 60%. Um, later we can talk about it in detail, if this is w what the discussion should be about. Historically, it's also interesting, this is from Ministry of Agriculture, where the water commissioner was located in the past, if you remember, from 1962, this map. And it shows Ezor Haklait, if I say it correctly, so the agricultural regions in Israel, in 1962. And you see these amounts, million cubic meters water consumption, total water consumption, okay? It should be tricha, I don't know what, okay? Um, so it's around or above 200 million cubic meters for each region. And then when I saw this map, I made like boom, boom, 0 0.8. What? 0 0.8, not even 1 million. So this is the area of Galilee where you have the highest rain, remember, in the north? Hafula, 273 million cubic meters, Nazareth, 0.8. This is 1962, this is the official map from the big Hamayim Be Israel, uh, and it was not a mistake and not a typo because they have graphs where they show exactly the same numbers. So first of all, I thought, like, what's going on? How much was the population, you know? So I checked the population, went to the statistical office and found out that the population is identical in Nasre and in Afula. It was almost identical, uh, Nasre had a little bit more, you know, like 121,000, 119,000 inhabitants, something like that. So this means per capita, Afula had 6,140 liters per person per day, 6,000 141 liters per person per day. And Nasre, less than 20 liters per day for all purposes. Afula, you can only explain through huge irrigation. Emek Israel, Gilboa, Bisan, you know it much better than me. And Nasre, how can you explain this? Well, the explanation is this. This map shows the villages that were destroyed in the Nakbe that are in red. And the villages that were not destroyed in the Nakbe, they are in green. So you can see where the Aravim, where the Palestinians inside Israel remained. And you probably are, again, much more aware than me of that, that only in the Galilee you had still large pockets of Palestinians remaining in Israel. This was a place with few Jewish settlements and mostly Arab population. So then it really shows how, after the Nakba, Israel was putting the neck up for Palestinians inside the state. They could not even dream of irrigating there, the people there. Well, they could not even dream, of course, also, because they couldn't even reach their fields, because they were under martial law. Huh? How is it called, martial law in Hebrew? Mishtat <laughs> Exactly until November 1966, seven months before the occupation started. They had the same restrictions, very, very similar to what Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza were facing from June 1967 on. I mean, to me, this is fascinating. As a German who is known to the uh, custom to the German discourse on Israel, that in 70 years of Israel, you have seven months of no military administration, but look how it, how it really precipitates in water, how harsh it is, such a regime. This is just to say that the conflict did not start in 67, okay? To me, this is an essential point. Also, if you want to really think about how to solve the conflict. How much has it changed since then? Because it's long ago, no? 1962? Well, this red 
is the portion that the non-Jewish localities in Israel get. For agriculture, 1,200 million cubic meters, as I said before, lady. Uh, and from 1970 until today and going on, 2% of agricultural water goes to Palestinians inside Israel. How much is the Palestinian proportion of the population? 20%. So there you have the discrimination. Kibbutzim, 600 million meter mukab. Okay, half of the water. Third, hafracha ve hashmama. The triumph, the pride, the desert bloom. Our Chancellor Merkel came to Israel and she was carried, uh, toured around here and went to some farms here in this area. And she said what Israel was able to do out of desert, what a power of will, what a power. Well, to begin with, um, not all the desert is green. This is about the limit of agriculture. Okay, South of it you have these places, this, this, and in this area the zoom out these places. The rest is pretty much still, you know, desert. There is a country that has made the desert green. It's your neighbor. Those guys. See them? Saudi, Saudi Arabia, using, like there is no tomorrow, like mad fossil water from the DC aquifer, south of Jordan here. Okay? Crazy. Absolute crazy. Thankfully, they have stopped. Okay? If you go make a um, satellite image now, you will not see the same anymore. If you had this zra, this uh, agriculture in the Negev, yes, you could say the Negev was green. It isn't. Be glad it's not, okay? Because it's not wise to plant ananas in Antarctica or to make a desert green. Please leave the desert, desert, desert and go to the green areas to have green. Okay, as simple as that, especially if we talk about climate change and so on, and we don't want to become Trumpists. So this is the limit of agriculture of Israel, more or less today. South of Beersheba you have hardly anything. This is the 400 millimeter iso Hyatt, the rainfall line. Until here, rain-fed agriculture is possible, Baal, they call it in Arabic. Um, rain-fed agriculture without irrigation. Until here you had already in the Ottoman, more or less, uh, uh, agriculture, so this expansion of Israel was this amount. Huge amounts of water used for that, though. Gershon Baskin from Ipkri, uh, Ipkri, I don't know if you are all familiar with this name. Um, you know him? Yes. Good. So Bershon, Gershon Baskin gave a quote I like. He spoke about Noah Kanarti, who was a real hardcore uh, water military. Okay? He was a military governor and he was uh, also the water negotiator for Rabin, he was in uh, different civil administrations, he later sat in the joint water committee vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians and so on. So Gershon Baskin talks about Kinarti and he says Kinarti is stuck in the Zionist ethos of making the desert bloom. Yes. Which, as everybody knows, is no magic. All you have to do is waste huge amounts of water. I love it. It's really, that's just the point. Last myth. Palestinians don't exist. Why do I say such a crazy thing? Uh, we are not at the times of Golda Meir. Well, in the water sector, when you think about it, there are two things I think that stick out to me. First of all, Israel's success story, making the desert bloom and uh, drip irrigation and so on, is always seen in isolation. It's not put in re relation to, from where did this water come? From whom was this taken away? On whose account, on whose cost was it achieved? So as if it was, Israel was uh, acting in a vacuum. In this story, the Palestinians don't appear. And then there is a, an, an additional thing, a different thing that is, is the conflict. It's not like that, okay? It's very physical, water. If I have it, you don't have it. If you have it, I don't have it, okay? It's not, you cannot detach it, you cannot isolate it, or at least not if you want to be fair. Second, Israel's politics, I would claim, it's often discussion, when I have in Europe this discussion, 
Israel's politics towards water or towards Palestinians, in my opinion, is not that they sit and think, how can we best harm the Palestinians? I don't think so. I don't think the main motivation of Israel's water planners is to say, ah, let's stick it to them, how can we make it more difficult? I think that's nuts and very wrong. I think that for these water planners in Mekorot and in uh, uh, Ministry of Agriculture and the Water Authority, Palestinians don't exist. They don't play a role. We don't even discuss it. It doesn't matter. That, I think, is the real thing. There are exceptions when Israel really does use water to punish Palestinians. These are exceptions. And to me, it's very important to differentiate between the two because this also gives an idea how much worse it can become if Israel would switch the politics to actually actively try to punish or harm or injure Palestinians. But most important, this myth of scarcity. The shorter part will now be resources, then some questions if you have. This is a cross-section through Israel and the West Bank, Eretz Israel, historical Palestine, however you want it. Here, this map, you don't see it very well, but of course we have indicated it. This is the green line. Okay. So this is the line around the West Bank. I just have to say it because in all Israeli maps you will not see it once. While, of course, in Palestinian maps, Palestinian Water Authority, you will always see it. This is a geological map. Geology is the, if you want, the science of earth strata, Tatsurot even. And each of these uh, layers has a different age and has a different color. So this is how you read a geological map. You have here the, the colors in green from the Cretaceous age, the time of the dinosaurs, 100 million years ago. And you have a cross section here through the southern west bank. This cross section goes from the sea up to the mountains and down towards the Dead Sea. And you see the two green layers, the dark green and the light green. The dark green is the so-called lower aquifer. Ha'agan, <coughs> Hamaim. Ha, how do you say? Tahtani. Lamat, Tahton. Okay. And Ha, Ma'alon, or what is it then? Melion. Okay. So these are the two aquifers that form the, what you also call the mountain aquifer, Ha'har. Agan Ha'har or Maze? Aquifer Ha'har. Ken. So aquifer, good old Hebrew word. Aquifer. I can remember aquifer. Um, so these two aquifers. These two layers are building up the aquifer. The important thing is, here is the axis. Al Khalil, Hebron, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Ramallah, Salfit, Nablus, Jenin. This axis is more or less the axis of the highest top of the mountains where the lower aquifer comes out. And here the upper aquifer comes out on this yeah, light green, and then if you f go down to the Jordan Valley, or you go down towards Israel, it's covered by the brown colors and the orange colors. The brown color is uh, Mount Scopus formation. Okay, Zenonian, this is chalk. How do you say chalk in Hebrew? No, 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 no. Not, not gear is limestone. This is gear. Kirton, kirton. What you use in school for writing? That's wrong. Even gear is limestone. Sorry. So this is chalk, it's a very soft limestone that is impermeable, okay? And um, this one, the brown one, cannot take water. No water can go into the ground here or here. Only where the green comes out, the, the rain can actually enter the aquifer. So this is the recharge area. This is what my PhD is about. And um, this means the aquifers are replenished here in the West Bank, almost exclusively in the West Bank, except here the Jerusalem Corridor. You see that part? That one. That is in Israel. And then you have two basins. The water drop, like the story for the little children, the little water drop comes from the cloud, goes to the ground, gets in. What happens? Then it flows. Either it falls here, it flows to the east. That's the eastern basin. Hagan ha... Mizrahi, or the western basin called Yarkon Taninim. It flows with the strata 
So this groundwater here flows away from Israel, flows towards the Bekaot, towards the Jordan Valley. Here the water flows into Israel. It's a, by natural conditions, Israel is the recipient, the coastal plain is the recipient of the water of the mountains. It's a transboundary aquifer. It goes over a border, over a boundary, which is very important under international water law because it should be f shared fair and equitably. Israel should have a right to get this water from Yarkon to Ninim because although the rain doesn't fall and doesn't seep into the ground in Israel, it's part of the basin. Israel has the right to get water from Yarkon to Ninim under international law. But the question is how much is equitable and how much is fair. So it's about the question about the quantity. The eastern, however, flows away from Israel. Only this tiny part here in Ein Gedi is part of the eastern aquifer. And I show it schematically so you understand the two aquifers in blue here going down to the east, going down to the west. And this is what, how we indicate water levels. If you drill in Ramallah or in Jerusalem, you will not get water. You have to go down the flanks. Only then the water accumulates in the aquifer. And then a well that is drilled here will have lots of water full and you can pump. So it will not be productive to drill a well up here in the mountains. You have to go down. Now if we say schematically, this is Israel, this is the West Bank, the point where the aquifer is fully saturated is very close to the green line. It's very near. The best conditions are in Israel, not in the West Bank for drilling. Here in the eastern aquifer, the same thing, it slowly starts accumulating. And here the water level is, the pressure of the water is reaching the ground itself. So if you have a crack, a fault, the water can come out by itself. We call it artesian. What do you have? Springs. May not. That is why you have the huge springs of Jericho. That is why that town was built. Because you have all the water that falls as rain in the mountains coming out here. That is why you had Yarkon Spring, or Urge Spring, okay, between Rosh Ain and, uh, and uh, Tel Aviv, with 260 million cubic meters water in the past, coming out fed from the mountains. These are the mountain aquifer basins, western aquifer, Kontanim, eastern aquifer, and then you have another third one, northeastern basin from Jenin, it flows to Gilboa. This is all the West Bank has, only the three, these three basins. And here, Ein Gedi, you see this little part from Israel, very, very little uh, share of Israel. Israel, of course, has the other basins, Tiberias, Galilee, Mount Carmel, coastal aquifer, Negev, Araba, and so on and so on. Not even to speak about the Jordan River. Gaza is part of the coastal aquifer, as you can see. So the West Bank has enough water, but Gaza hasn't. Now today I had to make a decision what I want to really talk about, because it's all too much. I will not talk about Gaza today. I'm very sorry. You have to invite me another time, and we make a whole evening on Gaza. Why? Because everything in Gaza is the opposite of the West Bank. It's really, everything is the opposite. The hydrology is the opposite, the hydrogeology is the opposite, the climate is the opposite, and Israel politics is the opposite. Okay? So, questions? Uh, I know that we have a lot of rain that comes uh, down here, and, and um, in Tel Aviv we are very uh, upset that the water, the rainwater is directed into the sewage water and to the sea, and it's not collected into the basin under Tel Aviv. So where, where do you calculate this water in your maps? What basin? Uh, I, it wasn't clear. The western aquifer basin here is part of the blue. It goes here, 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 and then it goes to the Mediterranean. But on top of it there is another aquifer, Aquifer Achof. So you have a shallow aquifer, Aquifer Achof, which directly gets the rain from rain falling in the coastal plain. Then it is disconnected, go here, it's, uh, this little white, you see that? That's the aquifer Achof. And it's disconnected from the other aquifers by impermeable layers here, these brown colors, okay? So it's two independent basins, the western aquifer filled in the West Bank. So this water accounts for 
that the rain that falls here accounts for the coastal aquifer. So the balance of the Sheruta hydrology uh, will then include these amounts in aquifer Achof. Okay? Yes, big amounts. Because it's a big surface. Giving water to the West Bank according to the Oslo agreements, is this given for free or is it paid for? And if it's paid for, can they ask for more and pay more? Yeah, good, good questions, but uh, it's, I will talk later about Oslo. But of course it's paid for, I can say that already, but it will later be covered in Oslo. I'm um, Epic Israel. We talked about that full and that's in Shah. And so now I, I imagine from that, that the, the source of that water is from the Northeast uh, Basin. Now, the uh, hydropolitical question is I understand that, uh, that that area has not been affected. This is the part the, within the Green Line. I, uh, now, I'd like to know how did the uh, Paris Agreement of 1995 uh, guarantee? That the, that, the, that, uh, that that the water would stay on the Israeli side of the line. That it's the if you bring in new topics like Paris agreements, uh, it's a different type of question. We have to should, should do it in the discussion later. So you are right. You are right. Exactly. Exactly. You are completely right here. The water falls as rain um, between Nablus here and Jenin. It goes into the ground in the northeastern aquifer. Palestinians, I can already say that, no big surprise, are forbidden to drill here. And then the water flows out through the huge springs in Gilboa, Harod, and so on. And you know that this is called Emek Hamayinot, for good reason, okay, Tal Amal, and so on. Uh, yes, Gilboa is the uh, water richest district in Israel. The coastal aquifer, it, you see it on the map. This is the coastal aquifer. It touches a little bit into the West Bank, okay? And Jenin is far away. It doesn't even reach much of the Western Aquifer. Most of the West Bank, as you can see, is the outcrop of the Western Aquifer. If you drill there, you have to drill deep to get the coastal, to get the mountain aquifer, thousand meters deep, and you get super much water. If you drill there in the coastal aquifer, it's not very recommended. In the coastal aquifer, you want higher yields, you go closer to the coast. Always the water accumulates downstream. How uh, accurate do you think that the Palestinian Water Authority's uh, data is, considering there's so much wastage and water lost in the pipe? So do you, do you um, think that they're as accurate as the Israeli water company? Because that's a question that comes up a lot. There's a lot of claims by the Israeli authorities that the Palestinians give wrong information. The second is maybe if uh, at the end you could um, Point, uh, if there's uh, research on, uh, you mentioned that uh, only, you know, Israel uses a lot of water and a tiny amount of, uh, of uh, agriculture. Is there research on the, like, the carbon footprint of that agriculture and how much it would cost to import that stuff? So, I mean, it's like, is there research on, on that and, then, like, the environmental impact of that? We haven't mentioned yet, so I do it already now. How much is the average consumption of Palestinians in the West Bank? I said 250 liters Israeli, 122 German. How much do Palestinians have for drinking water? Okay. So we had the number like 100 liters, including industrial water. But this is bulk. And now we come to the technical shit. How much is the actual net consumption of Palestinians? We guess. I have tried for years to come up with a solid exact figure. I gave up. I've given up. Ask somebody else. We have numbers of 50 liters, probably too little. We have numbers of 60 liters, could be. We have numbers of 70 liters. We have numbers, Bezalem has a report saying 73. Problem is, we cannot really say how much water do Palestinians get and use. Why? Because so much of the actual consumption from in Palestinian households does not come through a pipe. Okay? Piped water, blue water, we can measure. And there, the data of the Palestinian Water Authority are absolutely wonderful and perfect. I know them, okay? And usually, really, I can tell you the problem is if, if they haven't measured, it's missing. We have a lot of missing data. But it's not that they're making it up as far as I can see. 
I've worked for years also in the municipalities. They're very eager to have these amounts. This is really <laughs> these kind of engineers, you know, they really want these numbers. Problem is, so much water doesn't come through a pipe. People depend on a ber mai geshenim, bor or ber or whatever. So, a cistern. So many people depend on going to the spring. So many people depend on bringing tankers. Auzubillah. Okay. So, as long as this scandalous type of supply continues, all this goes unaccounted for. So we really can only guess. Nobody can run behind each tanker and measure. Actually, there are some nudniks who do it. It's called Ger uh, European Pro Water Projects. Okay? And it's crazy. They have tables, Excel tables, measuring all this. Why don't we stop it instead of measuring it? Okay? So I've given up. Let it be 70 liters, let it be 75 liters, let it be uh, 65. I don't know. Point is, especially as we had this discussion before with somebody already, it doesn't even matter what is an average. Or, no, it does matter, but it doesn't give you a clear picture what is an average because the gap is so wide. And you have like uh, islands of the blessed, like Ramallah, five star occupation where I live, and you have places not far from it where the situation is horrible each summer. Okay, so have a very big gap in distribution. So, um, yeah, more or less. Second question, uh, water footprint, ecology, and so on. I have a, come to Berlin tomorrow, I have a talk on that. Uh, it's a whole different lecture, it's really fascinating. Uh, no, not much work has been done on that. Your short answer is, uh, to your question is, yes. Well, I, I'm not aware of people calculating, off calculating water footprint, carbon footprint. I've, I'm not aware of that. There's a lot of water footprint, a lot of carbon footprint. I've, I don't know statistics that actually calculate that off. Uh, I mean, in, in England, in, in Netherlands, Höxtra and all these guys who really make the lead in the world water sector on virtu virtual water and water footprints. I'm not sure. Occupation. The O word. The Kilmet Eh. The Echtelal. Hakibush. What is an occupation? Do I have to tell you? Temporary military situation, it's called. No? I don't need to tell you. Okay. In Germany, I used to usually say Israel is a democracy, and then there's another half. There's another half under the Israeli roof, which doesn't even have a thin lacquer of democracy, which is ruled by military orders. How does a military order function? You have a military in charge, and he gives down the order. No discussion, no information, no appellation, no vote. No, and so on. That's it, military order. Clear. There are thousands of military orders, they are still continuing, as you know. And there are only three on water that are relevant. There are a few more, but altogether, even just a handful. Like there's one saying, oh, Bethlehem can open its waterworks now from an hour later or something. I know. Three that are important, very few. That's interesting. And they are very early, from the very beginning of the occupation. They are chronologically numbered. So, the first one on water is... Actually, the very first one was even before military order number one, there was a military ordinance in June 67. In June or July 67, saying, Jordan River, forget about it. Okay? Uh, annexing the... putting it as a military uh, security zone, the banks of the Jordan River, no more access for Palestinians. That was not... that was like minus Military order minus something, okay? First military order on water was number 92. It was from August 67, when still Alon was thinking about, ah, shall we give back the West Bank and so on. And it transferred the authority over water resources to the area commander, the area commander, military commander, or the military in charge. It's a few sentences, um, very raw written. What does it mean, authority over water resources, control over water resources? Well, it means authority over all water resources. Everything, every 
single drop. When we talk about ah, Israel is using most of the water or much of the water, no. Israel in the military order number 92 says 100% of the water. Not 99.98, 100% of the water is under our control. It doesn't mean Israel uses 100%. Of course not Israel, Palestinians use some water. But 100% is controlled by, by Israel. Interesting, that's the difference to settlements. Settlements are still expanding meter by meter. They are far from having covered 100% of the West Bank yet. Very far. Okay, in water. It was 15 of August when that happened. Every drop of a well, every drop of a spring, every drop of a cistern of rain belongs to Israel when it touches the ground. Okay? Second, military order 158. No. It's under the control. It's under the authority, under the control. I'm, I'm really, f I'm for 20 years I'm here now. I'm really looking into history of colonialism. And uh, European colonialism was really barbaric. I have yet to find an example where some colonial power went to such an extent. I am not aware of such an example in world history. Okay? So, if you, if you say we, if you had to do it, I wonder. Okay? But they did it, and it's still there. 158 says, November 67, and so early. Now, this is very important in the daily routines of water projects, the permit uh, system. Each Palestinian water project from now on needs an official Israeli permit to be issued by the military commander, the area commander, or the official in charge put in place by the area commander. After 1981, Sharon was the minister, when they built the civil administration, which is the military administration over the West Bank in Orville speech, um, it was the civil administration that has to issue a permit. And then the military order says, if you don't have such a permit, your project is illegal and can be destroyed, the one who does the project can be fined, and the resource can be um, expropriated. Well, if you drill a well 600 meters deep, it's not so easy to expropriate there. This, these were not hydrologists who wrote this military order, but I think you get the picture. Everything is forbidden by default if it's not allowed. Now, to be fair, also in Israel, Israeli water law says water is a public property or state property and you need to get permits to do things. But in Israel you can go to court. In Israel you can appeal and in Israel they have to answer you. With water it's like building permits in East Jerusalem. You know these stories, no? Where people uh, have asked for building a house on their own land 30 years ago and still haven't even got the answer. The military order says explicitly that the military commander can reject issuing a permit without giving a reason. He doesn't have to say why, just say niet. He doesn't even have to say anything. Okay? Or currently we have 13 or 16 departments in the civil administration that all have to agree. If one department says no, no permit. Anything needs a permit. What do I mean? If you want to drill a well, uh, okay, um, you need a permit, of course. If you want to connect to a spring and capture the water from the spring, you need a permit. If you want to lay a pipe from one city to the other, from a village to the city, from the well to the village, you need a permit. If you want to build a water network inside your town, you need a permit. If you want to build a water tower, you need a permit. If you want to build a water reservoir, you need a permit. If you want to need a pumping, build a pumping station, you need a permit. Even Israel says that rainwater harvesting cisterns that do not have a permit are illegal. That's why... 
No, but this is the this is the the thing of the military order. This is the thing of the military order. Military order says anything that is done is illegal. Now, that is why Israel destroys rainwater harvesting cisterns because they are illegal. To the perverted logic of the occupation, that is illegal. This is a violation of the military order. I live in Ramallah in an old house from the 50s. In, the, in Ramallah, there was a, a municipal um, rule that before you get a permit to build a house under the Jordanian regime, you first have to build a cistern. They encourage people to build cisterns. So I have a cistern. If an, a soldier came to my house and would say, where is your permit? I would say, sorry, I don't have. Okay, I violate the military order, of course. Everybody violates the military order every time because they are way, made in a way that you can't not violate it. How Israel applies the military order, this is your question, Daphna, is a different thing. Do they come to my house? Of course not. Why would they bother to stop for 20 cubic meters, okay, and make a big uproar in the middle of Ramallah? Of course they don't. When they target cisterns somewhere outside in the West Bank in the villages, it's not about water. 20, 30, 50, 60 measly um, cubic meters is really not of Israel's concern. Point is, the cistern feeds a shepherd. The shepherd has sheep and he can move many kilometers of area with his sheep, so the land is not fallow and cannot put into state land. Hmm? Military order number 291. Ah, no, sorry, one very important thing. Even you need a permit to repair a well that is licensed. So we have now 166 old, mostly agricultural wells from the Jordanian time days that are really old and breaking down faster and faster. They need repair, maintenance, rehabilitation, you name it. And we don't get permits to repair them. Israel says no. Agriculture is no priority. You don't need to repair it. Okay? So the number of wells is actually shrinking every day. This is military order 158. To make you the comparison, you have a car. You didn't steal it, you bought it. I assume most of you buy cars, don't steal cars. So, you have a driving license. You have your test plan. You have your insurance. You have everything. You start driving and your car breaks down, you have a flat tire or something, and now you need a permit to repair it, and you're not allowed to. No priority. Last one really completes the whole picture. It says that the military order, a military uh, administration commander can cancel all prior agreements. They are no longer uh, vo uh, they are void. Okay. And he can even overrule Israeli civil courts. So even if an Israeli court says this and this should happen, the military commander can say, no, I don't want. Now I'm not aware, you have to tell me, you are experts. Is that only in water so or is this in every field? But in water is the, it is the case. So he's next to God, this military commander. Kuljun Malik. The Western Aquifer is important. Why? Because it's the Yarkon Teninim, because it's the biggest, the freshest, the most productive, and the best uh, reachable groundwater basin. It's filled in the West Bank by rain, and then it flows towards the Mediterranean Sea. The west of the West Bank, of course, gets the clouds from the Mediterranean. When you go to the east, to the Jordan Valley, it becomes dry. You know all that. Here, this map shows you the wells in the Western Aquifer in the Yarkon Taninim. Actually, it extends further until Sinai. But then there are no more wells. And you see the green line. And you see the wells on the Israeli side and the wells in the West Bank. Now I have to say, almost all the wells you see in the West Bank are not Israeli wells. They're almost all Palestinian wells. There's a tiny one near um, uh, Ariel. And there's one that is broken down and they want to just rehabilitate it now in Ariel. And then you have this area here. These are, of course, Israeli wells, Eshkol well field. But it's in a no man's land, if you want. Okay. Now, you see already, wow, 
much more wells in Israel than in the West Bank. More importantly, you have to look at the colors of these dots. And then you see that one of these little green dots has less than 0.1 million cubic meters of water per year. It's a small well, 100,000 or less, 80,000 cubic meters per year. One of these orange dots has more than 7.5 million cubic meters, meaning each of these orange dots is equal to 100 of these green dots. Okay? And then you really get the power of this graph. Okay? The bizarre, absolutely bizarre, perverted misallocation. Palestinians actually get to use from this aquifer, which is recharged almost exclusively in the West Bank, except here, 6%. Israel uses 94% of the al -Kontaninim. Now comes my favorite number. And now you have to put out your pen and remember this number well. How many military permits, according to 158, the military order 158, do you think the Israeli military commander or civil administration issue for new Palestinian wells to be drilled in the Al Taninim from 1967 until the beginning of the peace process? Zero. Not one single well was permitted, and therefore not one single well was drilled. I mean, to drill a well 600 meters deep, seven, 800 meters deep, you have, a, you have to have a rig that you can't hide, and you sit there for three months, okay? It's not something imaginable that you could drill without being seen. A deep well in the Western Aquifer. None. How many wells, as a peace dividend, did Israel issue, how many, sorry, permits, did the civil administration issue to Palestinians in the Western Aquifer Basin from the beginning of the uh, peace process, which already lasts longer than the occupation before, until today? Zero. In the Western Aquifer, not one single well since Madrid or Oslo. So the sum of zero and zero, you can calculate yourself. That is the occupation in a nutshell. This is the Erkontaninim. Palestinian water sector was deep frozen in 1967, when I was three years old. Since then, the development in actual access to water in the areas that are most populated by the Palestinians in the West Bank is exactly how much? Zero. Exactly. There's not a number that is, you know, how much exactly, or is it reliable, or can we trust the data? No, this is a very, this is an absolute number, it's a qualitative number, you understand? The occupation is dead simple. It's dirt simple. The occupation is not a complicated thing, okay? This is the Western Aquifer story. Now, what did Oslo do, the peace process? In uh, 1993, Oslo 1 was the Declaration of Principles, and in 1995, Oslo 2 agreement was the catalog with more detailed uh, regulations for the interim phase that was to end in 1999. A so-called Joint Water Committee was installed in Oslo. A very nice thing. Israeli and Palestinian, Israeli authorities, Palestinian authority, the new authority, sit together in a room, may always in different places, mostly in Israel, and um, equal number of chairs, you know, and each decision has to be taken anonymously. You, each, each side can veto. You cannot vote or something by majority or something, it's either both agree or disagree. And there, it's supposed that Israel and the Palestinians discuss new water projects in the Shtachim together, okay? Both Israeli projects and Palestinian projects. What's wrong about that? That's perfect. That's wonderful, democratic, and equal. At least this is how our ministers and our German governments and our German press tries to, or likes, to believe. Well, there are several buts. 
First of all, it says all water projects in the Shtachim. So, Israel discusses with the Palestinians what can be done in the one side of the aquifer, but Palestinians cannot discuss what is on the other side of the aquifer. And you already saw where the music plays in the aquifer. So, this is the motto, what's mine is mine, what's yours is ours. Let's discuss it. Second, what are Israeli projects in the West Bank? Who is supplied in the West Bank? By definition, it can only be projects for illegal Jewish colonies in the West Bank. It cannot be something else. Well, it can be for an army base, yes, which, is, which also exists, but it's very, very little water. It's settler projects. So Palestinians are now allowed to discuss with Israel settler projects, quid quo, quo pro, for uh, their own projects. Palestinians are exposed to a blackmail from Israel. If they don't give Israel the settler projects, they don't get their water projects. Okay? This is a very smart new invention. Israel in this water committee has three levels of veto. First, you have a beneficiary, an NGO, a project, ministry, a municipality, a waterworks, whoever, says we would like to do something. They first go to the PWA, the Palestinian Water Authority, Rishut HaMaim HaFilistini. And they should prepare the document. So they already tell you, oh, give up, don't even ask. You will not get a permit. This is the first filter. Then comes a Palestinian coordinator. He suggests for the discussion for next meeting. Then he gives the papers to the Israeli coordinator from the Joint Technical Subcommittee. He makes a preliminary decision. First veto. He allows it to be uh, discussed or not. Guess what? If Palestinians say, we would like to discuss a new well in the Western Aquifer, in the Yarkontaninim, Israel say, no. If Palestinians say, Mbala, yes, we do want to, then Israel says, then there will be no meeting. Okay? The Palestinians are not even allowed to discuss a new well in the Western Aquifer, because for Israel this is over. Then comes the Joint Water Committee, and then they decide. It's called final decision, but it's not final. Because only if it's in area A or B, then the decision means something. Now, all the wells and all the treatment plants are not air built in the area A. They are built, almost all of them, very sorry to tell you, in area C. If it's area C, you all know what is ABC, no? I don't have to, okay. Uh, if it's C, it still goes up to the civil administration and you need the good, bad, old permit as ever before. Okay? And they can approve, issue a license, issue a permit or not. This is approval, this is permit. It's super bureaucratic. Palestinians are exposed to blackmail. And there is a very good article on it by Jan Selby, who studied it with really access to the documents in water alternatives. And he calls it a tool for colonization. Now, if we compare to before Oslo, this was the thing of before Oslo. A Palestinian wants to do something in water, he has to go to the civil administration, they say yes or they say no. Okay? That was before Oslo. What has changed? Yeah, well, you have seen how many wells uh, they have said in the Western Aquifer. Not too many. Sometimes. Ah, you mean in the Joint Water Committee? Well, that's interesting. I, I come to that. Um, so, now Israel has three veto levels, you have a huge red tape, but nothing has changed, actually. It's so frustrating. A, lot of get <laughs> a, a few people get salaries, yeah, it's a seven, seven or eight people, I think. Um, uh, yeah, seven, I think. Let's see. 184 wells were submitted in J JWC, in the Joint Water Committee. The main thing is wells. That's really tough. Now, 102 of them, that was for a certain period, 1996 to 2009, yes. That was the study time of this article of Jan Selby, the study period. 102 of them were actually just for repair. And they are still pending, meaning no final decision. The article was uh, studied until 2010. 26 of them 
are at the civil administration still pending, still waiting, still waiting. Years, sometimes a decade, waiting until you get an answer or not even an answer or a negative answer. 56 then of these 184 were approved by Joint Water Committee. Remember, this was approval, this is permit. Okay? Of these 56, 13 then were not drilled. Why? Because they had a very low potential. For example, Hizme well, it was shifted around so many times, 13 different times, 13 different coordinates, it was shifted around. Israel said, no, this quarry here, we want to build the wall. Here it's near the settlement, uh, uh, which is it? Gush uh, Radumim, what's it called? Near Wadi Kult, near Wadi Kult. Beside Malunim, Far Kvardumim and so on. Then they said, there in the quarry you can drill it. Well, yeah, I would tell them, don't drill it there, you know. So, low potential, okay. Twelve of them were anyway monitoring wells. A monitoring well is just to observe the water level. You don't take a drop of water out. It's just to make science, okay, or control. Twelve. Now, 27 were production wells, and they were drilled. Four of, the, four of them failed, were dry. Failure. We call it wildcat in drilling, and that's a normal thing. Israel has failures in drilling, no big deal. Just go on, drill the next one. For Palestinian, there is no drill the next one. If the first one fails, that's it. You've spent your permit, okay? Five, not yet equipped, because why? Why is it difficult to equip a well? Well, you must understand what Military Order 158 really says. It says any water-related project. So you need a drill welling perm a well drilling permit. Okay? Now you drill your well, it's uh, successful. Then you need a permit to get a pump. And Israel will ask you how much, exactly which specification. Then you need a permit to build an access road to the well. No, first you need the access road, so that you can put the rig on the site, yeah, somewhere, and drill the well. Then, it's successful, you have equipped it with a pump, you got the permit, you need another permit to get power to the place to run the pump. Then you need a permit to actually build a pumping station, a house for the well, for the well guard and so on. Then you need a permit to get the pipe from the well to the next uh, pumping station or booster station and so on. One of these chain elements breaks, there you go not yet equipped, low potentiality, so they were drilled and had, not, had water but not very good. Two of these wells were just substitute wells. Now I didn't mention that word yet, that's also important. Substitute well is when Israel says, okay, you have a well, it was drilled before 67 and the Jordanian times, it's legal, you have a license and we approve it's legal, it breaks down and then the Palestinian says, can I drill a substitute well. So Israel says, yes. You close the old one, you drill a new one, no additional quantity of water, it's just the same quota. Okay? That's a substitute well. There were some substitute wells drilled in the Western Aquifer. When I said, no, 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 in the times from 1967 till today, there were substitute wells drilled. So just to don't get me wrong, when I always said zero wells, it was zero new wells, additional wells. It's about additional water. It's about real water, okay? There were some substitute wells, a handful, handful like an Apta well, for example. Um, and two in this period in the Joint Water Committee, and then we have 17 wells. So that's how successful they are, okay? The, world, the West Bank is, in a way, unique. The West Bank didn't have a blue revolution yet. Have you heard the term blue revolution? Blue revolution means the systematic development of water resources that took place, you could say, in the last 100, maybe 120 years, all over the world, especially when you had engine-driven pumps. Okay, You could say that was the breakthrough, the first uh, pump uh, in, ported into Israel, I think, or oh, Palestine, sorry, was 1907, I think, no? And the first pump equipped well was Latrun, I think, no? There you go, there it started. The Palestinian Blue Revolution stopped in 67. That's it. 
every last Indian village has a well. Okay? They dig a well. In the West Bank, this is just an impossibility. Impossible. The Oslo figures. I don't want to deep, go deep into it because anyway, first of all, it's so long time ago and it's in a way a shame that we still talk about it. On the other hand, we have to because we're still stuck with it. I don't want to say it in detail. You have the three basins, eastern, northeastern, western basin. You have Israeli quantities and Palestinian quantities and Oslo said this was the approach, if you want to call it trick or whatever, it was the approach. It says, what is the existing use? How much does Israel now use from this basin? And from that and from that. And how much do Palestinians use from now, if now at this point in 1995 from the basin? So total use from the mountain aquifers that come from the West Bank, okay? 483 for the Israeli and 118 all Palestinian wells and springs in the West Bank together in 1995. Now, questionable, the numbers are not really correct as we found out later. And we can talk about it if you want, the details about Mekorot and uh, how they did it and so on. So this was the existing use and then there was the important condition, Israel said the existing use is sacred. You cannot touch the existing use. Israel said, we cannot, th this is not peace if we have to give up something, okay? The existing use has to be maintained, okay? That was the condition. And then they said, so how much is there? How much water is there in these basins? The estimated potential, they called it, which is a scientifically wrong term, but never mind. Again, these people are not hydrologists, they are military people, so they use that term. Existing use, 362, in the Al Contaninim. Potential, oops, 362 million cubic meters, yeah, the same. Northeastern Basin, existing use, exactly 145. Estimated potential, oops, exactly 145. So what this table does, or the trick does, is saying, we are very sorry, there is no remaining potential in this basin to drill more. If Palestinians would drill more than these 20 million cubic meters of well pumpage, then they would go beyond the potential. And that we cannot allow. We have to defend the aquifer okay, from over pumping. Okay? This is the thing that appeals very much, again, especially to my German government. We have to protect the already overused groundwater resources, so Palestinians should understand that. Min Allah, you know? Only the eastern aquifer miraculously had a remaining potential, 78 million cubic meters, and more or less this is what was promised in Oslo for Palestinian additional development, said 70 to 80 million cubic meters future needs was the term in the Oslo agreements, plus some quantities of immediate needs, okay? Now, we are 18 years after the end of what should have been the end of Oslo, okay, 1999. We had an existing use of 118 million cubic meters before Oslo. Let's say the number is correct. Problematic because it's not correct. Then 25 immediate needs, 27, 75 future needs. Together is 100. 120 and 100 is 220. That would what we should expect if we read Oslo and we stick to Oslo. By the year 1999, Palestinians should have developed, according to Oslo, 220 million cubic meters of annual obstructions from wells and springs. Okay? Kedurim and Maynot. How much are we today? What do you think? How far did we go 20 years after Oslo beyond that number? Have we reached 300, 400? Israel had already before Oslo, 483. The Palestinian population, as you know, has tripled. So how much do you think Palestinians now have in absolute terms? Any guess? About 90. Huh? 90, about 90. Yeah, well. Palestinians now have not even not reached this amount. Palestinians now have less than before Oslo. The Palestinian water supply from wells and springs has dropped, not per capita, in absolute numbers, 
by 30 million cubic meters. Now again, this number is also oscillating. It's not every year the same, especially because so much is spring flow. So it's 86, it's 98, 95, okay? Don't say, ah, Clement said it's exactly 93. No, every year is different. So you have to always then say in that year, in that year, or in a period. The numbers I will show you are averages for a period, 93. So Palestinians have lost each year more than a million cubic meters as a peace dividend. They were better off before the peace process than with the peace process. How much do you think Palestinians love the peace process? How bitter they are to hear the word peace process even. And this is real water. This is not something pie in the sky. This is actually heavy. If you don't have for two weeks in a row water coming out of your tap at home, do you know where you suffer first? Do you know where it really hurts? Have you ever had such a situation? In the toilet. If you and your family for four days have not flushed the toilet, because you just had no water to flush the toilet. Okay? You bring some water from a shop or somewhere to drink. Yes, the litter, no problem. Or you buy a beer, even better. Mark Twain says, water is for fighting, whiskey is for drinking. But on the toilet, when you live in a city, okay, you don't live in a garden, you live in a refugee camp or in a city. So this is not pie in the sky, this is something people feel really every summer. They dread every summer. Nev never mind how much it rained in winter, it doesn't matter. The next summer crisis is guaranteed because there's no access to water, because the quantity has even dropped below the amount that was available before Oslo when there was a triple, a, a third of the population. Hello. Israel has secured 100% control over the water, unlike settlements and so on. They've annexed all water, immediately 67, through military force. This has nothing to do with anything in international law. It's injustice under international law, straight and uh, without doubt. And the situation becomes worse since Oslo. This is the graph I want to show you. This is the um, result of Oslo in numbers, so you can see it as an as a image. The Western Aquifer is this amount of water, 400 million cubic meters, 200 zero, okay? Million cubic meters per year. All wells and springs, in blue the Israeli, in green the Palestinian. Northeastern Aquifer, Jenin Gilboa, okay? And then Eastern Aquifer. Only there you have a light green of a, some size, which is the Palestinian Springs, which is the springs of Jericho, El Orge, and so on. Okay? Otherwise, this is the situation, even in the eastern basin that flows away from Israel. Okay? Why? Because here you have settler wells in the Jordan Valley. Settler wells is the wrong term, it's Mekorot wells. Mekorot drilled them for the settlers. And you have the huge springs of the Dead Sea, Fashcha, and so on, some of which are brackish but very valuable still, very. They are not salty, brackish. Okay, let's, uh, let's leave it there and jump into the discussion. It took much too long, sorry. I just came back from eight days in Bethlehem interviewing um, nonviolent uh, resistors to the occupation and human rights activists. And they said we think about the occupation too much in military, that that's important but that the effect is what they call an infrastructure war. That's what's really defeating. So. And what you said seems to go further. If you would just ease some things, it could melt and it could develop so fast. But it's kept, and Israel has to put a lot of energy in this freezer, okay? It's not, it doesn't go by itself. This, this occupation, the civil administration, needs a lot of administration, every detail to keep this frost, okay? It's not something that is energy free, okay? Why the Palestinians signed this, the Oslo uh, water? I mean, you know, like, kind of looking back, is there any kind of interest now in, uh, in Palestinian society in talking about why they signed it? Not anymore. Yeah. They have to keep it careful, and um, if you ask me, I will not go with the main 
uh, discourse. I think there often uh, international NGOs or activists and also Palestinians are not very well informed. And I think that very often the cases are not so straightforward and it's not so easy. Okay? There are some cases where it's straightforward. Israeli, like Mekorot, under military uh, permit, drilled inside the West Bank, deep wells, and by that directly dried up a Palestinian well or spring. That is, for example, the case in Badala. That is a clear-cut case from the aquifers, from the basin, and so on. You hear the same about the Larosha spring north of Jericho, which used to be the strongest freshwater spring not under Israeli direct control. Uh, somehow usable for Palestinians, 8.3 million cubic meters per year, wow, okay. And is very, very bad now. Many say, ah, oh, the Israeli have drilled wells there, not so easy. Because is it the same aquifer, you know? Is it, the wells are much deeper, you know? The spring is a different one. Is there a connection? Is it, does it make sense? The real problem is not that settler uh, uh, settlement presence directly harms Palestinians. Um, that settlers take all the water, yes, they take a lot of water, 40 million cubic meters, in the Jordan Valley. But it's 40. Compared to 480 that Israel takes from the mountain aquifer alone, compared to 2,000 that Israel takes, compared to 1,200 that Israel needs to reserve for its own agriculture, you know? So this is for me, the main argument, and that's for me important to, do I have this? I have this. Uh, for me, important to, to always insist on, it goes very bad, I cannot, it goes too slow. Anyway, um, to insist on, that they, I think that real story is somewhere else, you know? To me, this is the top of the iceberg, the direct damage by the settlements. But you have to understand what is the ground current, the big flow, and that is the military orders. The daily routine, you know, not the, and that really is the big harm. That's the big numbers that are, are missing for the Palestinians, big numbers of war. And I would concentrate on the big numbers. <laughs>